Hi everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you everyone for joining me today. I am actually going to do a French Friday. Um, so every Friday I do a pairing of champagne and French fries. Hi everyone. Thank you all for joining. Um, so as I was saying, I should like to pair champagne with french fries and I'll explain more about the pairing later on. Um, but to get started, we are going to be doing the french friday with champagne tatinje. So today I have four different champagnes from champagne tatinje that I'm going to be pairing with four different types of french fries. So lots of champagne and fries to be had today. And I'll be sharing it with you guys why I chose these pairings, a little about the champagne house, and going over what makes a good pairing. So first, I have some questions. I did one on Sunday by myself, so this is my first or second time doing it by myself. I learned a little from doing it by myself the first time. So I wrote out some questions, which I'll show you guys, um, and kind of QA myself as we go through this. So the first question, if you didn't join on Sunday, is a brief history on the house of Tatinje. So for those who don't know, let me show you the bottle. Uh, I have this champagne, Brut La Francaise, which is the first one that I have poured in my glass. So Champagne Tatinje was one of the first houses in the Champagne region. So the first house was in 1729. And then in the 1930s, the Tatinje family bought the house. So it became Champagne Tatinje in 1930, I think it was 1932 when the family took over. And it's a family owned champagne house and still to this day is family run. And the president is actually a female uh, and her name is Battelle and she runs and oversees the house. So an amazing house, amazing history. I just wanted to kind of give you guys a brief history. Also, uh, this is a Chardonnay focused champagne house. So they use usually a 30% blend of Chardonnay and all of their vintage or non vintage and vintage champagnes. So they really like to focus on the Chardonnay grape. And the next question I have, so I want to tell you guys, I keep doing these the wrong way, an overview of the rosé making process. So I actually have two rosés today that I'm going to be sharing. So the rosé making process is a process in Champagne that can be done two different ways in the Champagne region. The first way is to blend still red wine into the blend. So the, the grapes undergo the first fermentation and in Champagne there's two fermentations. So the first fermentation is just to make the still wine and the still wines are lightly pressed so there's no color in these still wines. However, with the rosé they want that rosé color. So you add a blend of either a Pinot Noir or Pinot Meunier to the still <coughs> uh, white blend to make the rosé. The other way you can do this is the Saunier method, which is similar to making red wine and the maceration is used so the grapes sit, sit together and ferment to get that color. So Champagne Tatinje is using the method where you add the blend of still red wines. So I just wanted to give you guys that brief foundation. Hello. And the next explanation that I want to go over are explain dosage levels. So a dosage level is the sugar that is added during the champagne making process. 
So with champagne, unlike still wines, sugar is added for the, in the sale of the final product. So all still wine goes through the sugar, uh, changing it, fermenting and changing into the alcohol. But after this process, in champagne, they add additional sugar, and this helps with their house style and to find balance. So there are seven levels, and the first one is called Brut Nature, and this is the least amount of sugar, and it is zero to three grams of sugar per liter. The next level is called Extra Brut, and Extra Brut is zero to six grams per liter. The next style is brew, and brew is the most popular style. And the one you're gonna see for most non-vintages is gonna be a brew. Most champagnes sell their brew style. And this style is zero to 12 grams per liter. And due to champagne global warming and the area getting warmer, this used to actually be zero to 15 grams of sugar per liter. But with global warming, the grapes have been getting riper, so they do not need to add as much sugar. Also, personal preference is changing, so it kind of changes throughout history. When champagne first started, it was very sweet, and it was the last level that I'm going to talk about, so it was the sweetest style. But now, it's common for champagne houses to use around 9 grams per liter, so they don't even go up to the 12 grams when making their brute style of champagne. The next style is known as extra sec, and this is 12 to 17 grams per liter. And this style has a, a little more than the brute. And then next is sec, and sec is 17 to 32 grams per liter of added sugar. And then after that, there's 32 to 50 grams, and that's known as demi sec. And then finally, the last level of sugar is known as, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, it's D-O-U-X, so it's do or do, um, and that's the highest amount of sugar, which is 50 grams of sugar or more per liter, which I know sounds like a lot, and all of these are sounding like maybe high percentages of sugar that you don't normally think about, but this is for the entire bottle, and if you're thinking about you, you're just having a glass of champagne, for a brute style, it's about half a gram of sugar in a glass of champagne. And I kind of wanted to also give some comparison. So you're thinking a half a gram of sugar for the brute champagne, a demi-sec champagne would have eight grams of sugar per glass, a gin and tonic has 14 grams of sugar, Starbucks, so if you go to Starbucks or any coffee shop and like, you know, your lattes, that's going to be 17 grams of sugar. And if you're having a margarita, just to compare it to a glass of champagne, that's 20 grams for a margarita on the, on the rocks. Um, that's not a skinny margarita. This is one made, the traditional margarita made with simple sugar. And then a Jack and Coke, for those of you who like Jack and Cokes, that's 33 grams per glass. So champagne, I know it sounded like it was a lot of sugar in these, but they're really not that much. So I just kind of wanted to give that foundation and baseline to everyone so you kind of have a good understanding of the sugar levels. Uh, as I have a champagne that's a higher sugar level than a brute style. So I wanted to set that foundation first. The next question is, what is a Grand Cru? So I wanted to talk about Grand Cru's. I talked about them a lot, so I'll just briefly explain that a Grand Cru, uh, a Cru is a village. So in Champagne, there are 320 Cru's or villages. And different uh, villages have different status, and this status was created in 1911. So the Grand Cru is the highest status of all the Champagne villages and there's only 17 of these villages throughout Champagne. So now I'm gonna go on to the Champagne, and for those who are joining again, this is the first Champagne that I have. I talked about it in detail on Sunday, so I'm just gonna quickly go through this one today. So the question is, Oh, 
can't get these papers. So what is the style of the Brut La Francaise? Which is Tatin J's non-vintage Brut. So this style, like I said, the house style is Chardonnay focused. So this is a 40% blend of Chardonnay grapes and the remaining balance is among Pinot Noir and Pinot Munet. So this is aged for three to four years in the cellar. So more than the minimum in Champagne, which is uh, 15 months for non-vintage. And this is their non-vintage that's being aged for three to four years. And there's a nice body. You guys can see the nice golden yellow color on the glass. I'll hold it up so it's closer. So on the note that on the nose, there's lots of fruit. I'm getting like peach and apple. There's some white flour, and then you also get that brioche. And the brioche or the breadiness is known as the champagne bouquet. And it's common for champagnes to have this aromas and flavors in the champagne. So this, like I said last week, I love this non-vintage brew. I think it's a great value. And I get a lot of honey on this one, but it's not overpowering sweet. It's just a nice subtle hint of honey, which I think is great. So overall, I would say that this wine is very elegant and very balanced. So for this type of champagne, I, so I have di different styles of fries. I'll go over more. I guess I'll talk about all the champagnes and then I'll go over the fries for everybody so I don't get mixed up. So the next question, it looks like I, oh, I don't know if I, I might have messed up. But the next question is what is the style of the non-vintage champagne? So. I have the non-vintage champagne, which is here. I have it on ice. And this is the bottle, so you all can see it. So super refreshing. I know it's finally rosé season. I feel in California, it's rosé season. We could kind of say it's rosé season all year long, but especially today, I'm so glad I'm open. I have two rosés today. I'm so glad I'm opening the rosés today as it's going to be, it's in the 80 degrees, it's been the 80 degrees the last few days in LA. So perfect time to pop open some rosé. So again, I'll hold up the bottle, maybe as I explain, so as people join, they know what I'm talking about. So the, the Prestige Rosé has an intense lingering to it. And I'm going to smell it too for you guys. So it's very complex, and the, the Pinot Noir used in this adds to that complexity. So there's 15% of still Pinot Noir added to this rosé champagne. So this helps with this color. If you can see, it's, it's kind of a medium pink, I would call it. It's not super deep, but it's not super light either. And that's to the 15% of the still rosé that's added to the blend. And this is Pinot Noir, and it comes from the Montaigne de Rennes, and as well as Le Rissi, if I'm pronouncing that right. My French is so bad, guys. I feel like now that we have this situation going on, I should take an online French class. But Le Rissi is the champagne, re um, sorry, not champagne, the rosé re region in Champagne. And they have an AOC for a uh, the rosés there as well. So that's some history on where, or some knowledge on where the rosé, the red color is coming from, the still red wine. So I, I don't know if you guys can see the bubbles on this, but they're nice and fine and they're just kind of running consistently. So there's this nice steady line of bubbles on the champagne. So, I'm getting a lot of red fruit. So that's common with rosés as well to get that red fruit. And definitely getting some raspberry. It 
I'm still getting that fruitiness on the palate. Definitely some raspberry, some cherry. It's just nicely balanced. It's, it's fuller, fuller body because of that Pinot Noir. So it adds to a fuller body consistency in this rosé. So I would say this is very fruity, fresh, and vibrant. Definitely a great rosé to pop open during as it's getting warmer. And my next champagne is going to be the Prelude Grand Cru. So I'm going to talk about the style of the Prelude Grand Cru. So that's why I went over Grand Cru's for you guys at the beginning. So this is the bottle. Hold on, I'm drying it up. This is the bottle of the Tatinje Prelude Grand Cru. And I got to taste this for the first time when I visited the Champagne region in December. So an excellent, excellent Champagne. Really excited to be sharing with you guys today. So it's called Grand, the Prelude Grand Cru because the grapes are sourced from the Grand Cru region. Oh, I forgot to pour it. Um, so the grapes are sourced from the Grand Cru regions of Champagne. This blend is 50% Pinot Noir, 50% Chardonnay on this one. And I'll show you guys the nice, you can see those bubbles again. I mean, they're just beautiful in the glass. So again, this is a pale yellow. It's actually a little lighter than uh, the non-vintage. I'm getting some nice freshness from this champagne. Definitely some minerality. Cheers, cheers everyone. I don't know if anyone else is drinking with me. I know it's noon, or in California it's noon, but it's Friday, so gotta start at some point. If anyone else is drinking, let us know what you're enjoying, or if Anna opens up something tonight, you can let us know too. So the minerality, there's some green notes, green apple. There's also a little bit of cinnamon and some floral notes. I'm getting a hint of peach as well. So this is a nice, smooth champagne. Definitely an easy drinker, for sure. So the next one is the, Sal the Nocturne Rosé. So this will actually be my first time trying this Nocturne Rosé uh, live with all you guys. So this is the bottle. This is actually a really pretty bottle. Show it to you guys. It's very fun. I feel like it's the perfect nightclub bottle or late night bottle and that's kind of why it's called Nocturne because you could have this late into the evening. So this is a blend, again, of 30% Chardonnay. So a higher percentage of Chardonnay. And then there's Pinot Noir and Pinot Munet in this one as well. So it's 50% Pinot Noir and 20% Pinot Munet. And again, here's, here's the bottle. Fun bottle for sure. So this is a sec champagne and I was going over the dosage levels earlier. So SEC is 17 grams to 32 grams of sugar per bottle. And this is actually 17 and a half grams of sugar per bottle. So it just missed the cutoff 
on being extra sick. <laughs> um, so it's, if it was, you know, 16.9, it would have been considered an extra sec, but because it's 17 and a, 17 and a half, it's sec. So it's gonna, it's not gonna be as sweet as some other sex, sex styles because it's 17 and a half grams. So it's at the lower end of the spectrum. So this was aged for four years. And again, like the other rosé, it's made in the same way. So 15% still Pinot Noir is added to this blend. And I'll show you the color on this one. It's almost, it's like a pinky, like a salmon color, I feel. So these are the comparison. This is the non-vintage and this is, they're both non-vintage. This is the brew or the Prestige, and this is the Nocturne. Okay, so I'm getting like a hint of sugar. So it's not overly sweet or over, overly, you know, the sweetness isn't overpowering. It's very subtle. And you kind of, you can notice the tannins on this one due to the, at, the adding of the Pinot Noir. So very smooth, silky tannins on this. It's very fresh and it's definitely also an easy drinking rosé. So those are the four. Oh, I think it paused, so I'm back. Not sure if it froze or if you guys can see me still. Hopefully it's still working. If anyone can let me know. Okay, good. So the ideal, the next question is the ideal serving temperature. So the ideal serving temperature for champagne is 10 to about 12 degrees Celsius, which is about 50 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit. So depending on the style, I think I would do not too cold for the prelude. So maybe more like 12 degrees Celsius, 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the rosés, I do like them you know, not as cold either. So I wouldn't serve these under 50 degrees at all. They're all very well balanced, very nice. So I think that's a great serving temperature. Why is that one? So that's a good question because it is cloudier. Uh, and I don't know if anyone from the brand is on, but I could ask that because I actually don't know the answer to why it looks a little cloudier, but that's a good question. So I'll follow up on that. So I'm going to talk about the French fries. I see someone asking about the food. So you can definitely pair this with food, but you can also pair this, you know, I mean, have this as an aperitif. All of these can be drank it, drunk before a meal as an aperitif. And the sec, which is this one here, can also be kind of drunk throughout the evening. That's why it's called Nocturne, because it has the consistency to last throughout the evening. So now the French fries. Um, and we're gonna start. So I did four styles of French fries, just so you guys can see. So the first one is actually tater tots. So I have tater tots, cheese, and caviar. So caviar, I think, always goes with the champ champagne. The cheese, the cheese you can definitely pair it with champagne. You can pair different types of cheeses with champagne. I think Brouillet cheese would go really well. This is actually just like a mozzarella cheese. And I put this all on these tater tots. And this one I think I would pair with the Prelude, which is, I'll show you the bottle but it's the Grand Cru, because there's a little more sub substance to them. And then, 
I have some seasoned waffle fries, which I'll show you guys. And that one I decided to pair, I should move this a little. Um, that one I decided to pair with the Prestige Rosé. So these are seasoned. I think the season, the season, the seasoning will go well with the rosé as the rosé has a little more tannin and a little more structure so it, it can hold up to these seasonings better. Then I have two in here. I don't have enough containers but the one on, well it's my right so it might be your guys' left, is the, chip, the french fries, just a normal french fry but I actually made it with truffle oil and truffle powder. So I'll show you guys what I used in case anyone's interested. So I used these two different truffle flavorings to make the truffle fry. And then the last one, I actually did a sweet potato. I haven't done a sweet potato before, but I thought the sweet potato, it is sweeter. And I did add a little bit of brown sugar and I would pair that with the sec, the Nocturne Rosé to match the sugar level. So when thinking about pairings, it's a good idea to match different sugar levels. So if you had something sweet, you probably would not want to have that with the brew because the sugar, the sugar in the food is going to overpower the champagne. So you definitely want to try to find a balance. And I think with food pairings, it's always good to test things out because you never know how something's going to taste until you try it. But in a general rule for champagne, it's such a high in acidity food that it goes very well with fried fruit. So fried chicken is another very good pairing for champagne. And french fries, of course, I think is an excellent pairing. And as you can see, you can do french fries in a multiple different way to go with the different styles of champagne. And I was going to do something a little fun and I know, you know, it's getting warmer and I was thinking of like a fun cocktail idea and I know not normally you would do a cocktail idea, but it's just something fun and I'm trying it. Might not work, um, but I'm just adding a little bit of ice to this bigger glass and some fruit. So I told you I was getting some of the raspberry notes, so I added raspberries, and then I just added a little bit of blueberries. And it's a big glass, and I am gonna make a fun little cocktail with the sec, or the nocturne. So kind of a fun spritzer. I know normally you, you, you wouldn't, I mean, there are champagne cocktails, so this is kind of just a twist on doing a champagne cocktail. So it's kind of a fun, I just put like a couple ice to ice cubes and then the berries. I don't have strawberries. Another great one probably would have been strawberries and the raspberries. Now you definitely can smell that berry flavor. It smells really good. It smells like a nice fancy champagne cocktail. Pretend we are in the south of France. I like it. It's good. If you like berries, it's definitely great for the summertime. And as the nocturne, and you're supposed to drink it at night. So, I mean, I haven't been out dancing for a while, but this would be a fun one to be out dancing with and enjoying, you know, the night. Yeah, I think it's fun. It's, it's different, but it's fun. Uh, you can either love it or hate it. But I always think with wine and champagne, it's always good to try new things. That's why, how you can feel if you like something or you don't like something. So this was just something I threw together. I'd actually be interested in adding maybe some either mint or basil, probably basil to this. Sorry guys, what food pairings go best? Yes, now I definitely get all the fruit flavors. Lots of, now it's a lot of, fr very fruity. Uh, what food pairing would go best with each style? So again, I think you can have these all as an aperitif 
Also, sashimi and fish go very well with these. So I think uh, sashimi would go great with the rosé or the non-vintage. I think the prelude you can pair during the meal or, you know, maybe with like a lobster bisque or some lobster I think would be great. And then of course the Nocturne, it actually said on their website you could pair this with chocolate. So I don't have any chocolate, but I think that would be a fun pairing too. Since it is sweeter, chocolate is recommended, but you could also do this with a fruit tart. So it talked a lot about fruit desserts and fruit tarts. So that's kind of what gave me the inspiration to add the fruit to the glass. You kind of have a low calorie dessert here rather than having a tart and a champagne. So those are some ideas for pairings. And then last visit, in case you guys enjoyed all of this, and if you're ever out to Champagne, yes, definitely sangria, sangria vibes here. It's my fancy sangria. So can I visit Tatin J? And yes, Tatin J is open to the public, and you can visit. And they're closed right now due to the situation, but they plan to reopen. Their website says on July 15th. So I don't know if travel is in anyone's immediate future right now, but just if you ever want to take a trip to Champagne, you definitely can. And I got to visit, if you were on my last live or you weren't, I got to visit and had the most amazing time. They have the chalk caves or quarries that were dug out by the Romans in the four or five hundreds. And they're still around today. And this is actually where they age a lot of their champagne so it's a very cool tour and then after you can do a tasting and there's different options for the tastings they have the prelude they have rosé tastings the brew so there's definitely a different options a great idea and a fun to visit with your next guest julie you definitely need to try some tatin jay oh it looks like we have a question in the question block do they have a blanc de blanc so they're blanc de blanc yes since they're a chardonnay house their Blanc de Blanc is their actually prestige cuvee. And this is called the Comte de Champagne, which is the Count of Champagne who they named it after as he brought a varietal back to the Champagne region, which is thought to be one of the parents of the Chardonnay grape. So their Blanc de Blanc is actually their prestige vintage. And it's excellent. It's one of my, I usually don't like to say favorites, but I, I, it's one of my favorite champagnes. I love that the 100% Blanc de Blanc with the Chardonnay. It's an excellent champagne, excellent quality, and it can age for a long time. It could probably age 20 years. So definitely a great uh, Blanc de Blanc that they produce. Okay, let's see the questions. Oh, the comment. Okay, these are just general information. So I'm showing this one again. And it doesn't look cloudy. It could have been that it was colder. So I think that is why. Well, I'm like, I think it's just my glass and the temperature of why it was looking like that. Because as it's warmed up, it's definitely. You don't see that. So it was probably too cold because I did have it on ice. So that was probably the reasoning. Hello. So the re well, are you drinking four of those glasses yourself? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm gonna have to drink it. I don't like wasting champagne. So I technically have five now with the, my little cocktail. So it's gonna be a, a fun Friday. So I hope everyone else has a great Friday. I don't know if anyone else has any more questions. But thank you guys all for joining me for my first French Friday featuring champagne, tatin jay, and French fries and different ways to pair the types of style of champagnes with different French fries. So thank you all again. Oh yeah, yes, it was too cold. So the cloudy color was because, yeah, you, it's not like that anymore. It's definitely because I had it too chilled. It was the longest in the ice bucket. So that was just from the glass. So thank you all again. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. Cheers.